Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the tutorial on incentive compatible and incentive aware learning, which is uh, organized as part of uh, EC20. Uh, I'm Harapoli Mata, a fourth year PhD student from Harvard, advised by Hilin Chen. And I'm Nika Hakalab. I'm an assistant professor at Cornell, moving to UC Berkeley in the spring. So, um, just a word on logistics. Uh, there are three ways uh, in which you can ask questions. Uh, one, you can uh, use the raise hand feature in, the, in Zoom. Uh, the co-tutor, basically the tutor that's not currently speaking, will uh, see when we have enough hands and uh, coordinate with the tutor that's actually speaking at the point to uh, raise the questions. And we need to unmute you in order to raise a question like that. Uh, you can actually write questions in the chat window or the Q&A window, uh, especially if they are clarification questions and they do not need to interrupt the tutor that's currently uh, speaking about the particular part. The other tutor will answer the questions in the chat window or the Q&A window. Uh, and if they think that they need to be addressed to the whole class, they will just uh, coordinate with the tutor that's currently speaking to uh, have all the questions addressed and answered uh, for everyone. Okay, and uh, just a word on today's agenda before I start with the material. Um, so today uh, we will be talk. We will split today's agenda in two parts. In part one, uh, I will explain why we care about strategic learning settings. And, in, uh, and I will also give some uh, basics for game theory and mechanism design. Then Nika will take off and she will talk to us about uh, basics of machine learning theory. This will be split into two parts. The first part will come uh, before the break. Uh, we will have a break of 15 minutes and then we will have uh, Nika's second part of the basics of machine learning theory. And afterwards, Nika will talk to us about online learning in incentive compatible mechanisms. Um, then we will have another 15 minute break. And afterwards, we will come back in the other links that you have for the exercises session, which will be one hour and both Nika and I are going to be in this in this session. Okay. Now, let me start. Uh, I'm sure most of you in this audience know that machine learning um, has affected uh, the technological life drastically. Uh, we all use like virtual assistants uh, and many other things that use machine learning. Now, what's really important to see is that machine learning uh, more and more is uh, affecting our real lives by, um, by being used, by being deployed for real life decision making. Let's see a couple of examples. Um, a machine learning algorithm might decide whether you qualify for a new loan. Um, a machine learning algorithm might, might decide whether you uh, qualify for probation or not. A machine learning algorithm might decide whether you are good enough for, your, uh, for the next job that you apply. And the machine learning algorithm uh, might be the one that decides uh, whether you qualify for a better uh, insurance premium or not. Uh, and all of these things have a number of impl implications uh, for because people can actually try to game the machine learning algorithms in order to gain something out of them, in order to change the decisions that they uh, that these algorithms uh, that these algorithms make. And these implications can uh, vary. They can be of many sorts. For example, they can be monetary implications. Think about the example of Zara who decided to deploy a linear regression algorithm in order to decide uh, how to restock uh, particular items in its stores. And in order to do so, it asked from the managers of its store to report the expected amount of articles that they will sell, the, the expected amount of uh, uh, items that they will sell from a particular article. Now managers, because, uh, because their compensation and career promotions were depending on how much on the amount of items that they sell, they wanted to make sure that the top selling articles will always be in stock. So they misreported uh, how much the amount of items that they thought they would need uh, in order to game the algorithm. And that's just a simple example where uh, the implication was monetary and it was 
closed in a small bubble of people, namely the Zara uh, employees and the Zara managers. Uh, but we can actually have not only monetary, but also health-related implications of gaming machine learning algorithms. For example, uh, two insurance companies in Hong Kong, they decided to try to give incentives to people to work out more. And actually, they wanted to tie these incentives with um, giving them better insurance premiums. And here's how they did that. They asked from uh, people, from, uh, they asked from their customers to, um, to send them the data from their uh, health apps. And if they saw that somebody was registering enough steps every day, or they were running enough, or they were generally exercising enough, they said that this person seems to qualify for a better insurance premium. But here's how, what Hong Kongers decided to do in order to game this algorithm. They created these cradles, these phone cradles, that uh, you put your phone in, you just sit on your desk, and they move, and they essentially they register steps. And you can actually see in this video that I have here that it has registered, it has registered, I think, a full kilometer, like kilometer or something, and you haven't done anything. So it, it looks as if you're exercising, but you're actually sitting on your desk. And uh, finally, I would say that the most well-known example of what can happen, the most well-known implication of what can happen due to gaming uh, comes to us from the fairness literature, and it's the altered outcome uh, implication due to gaming. And this is especially important for the case of school admissions, for example, where um, this each school might deploy an algorithm which might be a mechanism designed algorithm that is essentially a cutoff of, uh, who, of who gets admitted to the school and who doesn't. And all, this, all, the, all, the, all the applicants that have features that, is, that pass this classifier are classified as plus one, so they are admitted to the school. And all of the applicants that have feature vectors that are below the cutoff, they are classified as uh, non-admitted. And in order to gain these algorithms, some manipulation examples include taking, for example, the SAT, the SAT test multiple times in order to uh, make the feature that corresponds to SAT score better, um, or pay extra for SAT preparation classes. Again, this would make the feature that corresponds to the SAT score become better. And I'd like to stress that uh, these types of manipulations do not only arise in uh, college admissions, but they also arise from high school when people can actually misreport their school preferences if they know that they will not get in their top preferred school, but they absolutely want to uh, get into the second uh, preferred school. They would try to misreport their school preferences just to make sure that they get this school or they could actually move to another high school in order to have a better class ranking, despite not preferring that school as much. And I'd like to, to point out here that somebody might say that, well, why are these really manipulation examples, especially when we're talking about the college admissions, uh, the college admissions examples? Well, they are really manipulation examples because students do not actually become better uh, as a result of these manipulations. So it's not that if somebody has taken the SAT test multiple times, it's not that they have become better or that they've gained a deeper understanding of the material and thus they, they, they can be admitted to, 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 the, to the school of choice now. It's that they've actually uh, memorized these types of exercises and they've spent a lot of time uh, focusing on like solving these types of problems in a very uh, short amount of time. So and this is actually shown by studies. It's not that they become better students, it's really manipulations. And what really went wrong in these examples? Why, why are we seeing these types of uh, manipulations in, machine, in the deployment of machine learning algorithms? Well, at the heart of the machine learning paradigm, and especially, it's especially true for offline machine learning, uh, the patterns in the data can uh, guarantee can actually cause accurate predictions for the test data. And that's true because both the training and the test data, they come from the same distribution, from the same population. So if you see patterns in your training data, then the, these directly correspond to accurate predictions in your test data. But when we try to apply machine learning algorithms in real life for real life decision-making and policy-making, 
what we are, the causality that we are making is that patterns in past data imply accurate predictions for future data. But the problem now is that this past and future data do not come from the same distribution. And in fact, the past data is actually data that is describing the people's properties, the people's characteristics, private information, which means that they can be altered when, um, when these people give their data to the machine learning algorithm, to the mechanism designer. And why would they try, why would they try to give uh, such, to, 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 to give such uh, mis, misinformation? Well, their goal is to actually achieve, uh, to gain the predictions and to get better outcomes uh, in the future data. So we really see that uh, when machine learning algorithms are deployed for making real life decision making, uh, this causality actually breaks. It's no longer true that we can guarantee that patterns in past data result in accurate predictions for future data. And by the way, I'd like to stress here that this is also known, uh, this has also been uh, uh, observed in economics under the name uh, Goodhart's Law or Campbell's Law or McNamara's Fallacy. Uh, so it's something that's also been studied from the perspective of economics as well. So the goal in this tutorial is to study strategic data sources for machine learning algorithms um, in the way that present both a challenge and an opportunity. Well, why a challenge? Well, they present a challenge because data received for training of the ML algorithms is, is no longer accurate. And when we do not have trust in our data, we can no longer have trust in the machine learning algorithms and especially in the outcomes that these machine learning algorithms give out. And think about, for example, uh, if you are a, if you are um, a forecaster, and you uh, collect predictions from different experts because you want to inform yourself in order to make a, an, informed, uh, an informed prediction about uh, an event in the future. Now, if these forecasters do not actually give you their honest beliefs about what the event is gonna be, then you might be completely, uh, your algorithm might be completely destroyed, completely misguided because you inform your decisions on something that's not really the general belief. And why can uh, strategic data sources for machine learning algorithms be really an opportunity? Well, we can actually try to construct machine learning algorithms that adapt to the behavior of the strategic agents. And in this way, uh, we can use the data, we can use the machine learning algorithms as a societal force for good. Think about, for example, the school's admission, uh, the school's admission example that we, that we said, that we mentioned previously, if there was a machine learning algorithm that could incentivize students to spend more time in studying the material, gaining better understanding of the, of, of the material that's being tested, then that would be really a positive outcome for the whole society. We would be more just in uh, judging students. So the solutions that uh, many researchers have uh, come up with and we will be presenting in this tutorial are uh, on the one hand, incentive compatibility for uh, as a form of robustness essentially to uh, training your algorithms uh, when uh, the data that you receive uh, can be inaccurate. And on the other hand, incentive awareness in order to make your algorithms adapt to the behavior of the strategic agents. And um, in order to be able to study incentive compatible and incentive aware learning, we actually need to draw both from the literature in machine learning and mechanism design. And for that, in this tutorial, we start with brief introductions in, on game theory, mechanism design, and machine learning. Um, I'm gonna do the introductions of game theory and mechanism design, and uh, uh, Nika afterwards uh, will uh, do the basics of machine learning theory. And before I go into the details of the uh, game theory and mechanism design introduction, um, I'd, like, I'd like you to keep in mind uh, three questions for every incentive compatible and, every, and, and incentive aware learning. Essentially, these are the questions that guide uh, each strategic learning setting. First, uh, the question that we need to remember is what is the goal of the learner 
and what are the goals of the agents. For example, in the school's admission process, the goal of the learner is to decide which students to admit in college. And the goals of the agents, which are students, um, are to pass the cutoff and get admitted in college. Uh, the second question is, uh, what is observed by the learner regarding the agents? Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, in the, in the school's admission example, uh, what is observed is only the candidates submitted SAT scores. You are never able to observe how much time the candidate spent studying the material or the, the other hardships that the candidate had. You only get to observe the submitted SAT scores. And finally, we need to pay attention to what is the agent's ability to respond to the decisions that are made. And what do we mean by that? Well, this is a question of the power and the constraints of the agent. For example, in the school's admission process, um, the power that you have is the times that you can take the SAT or the amount of money that uh, you can spend for tutoring. And there are some constraints that basically are, that are invariable and you cannot surpass them. For example, you cannot change your age. Okay, so now that we have completed the first part uh, of why we care about strategic learning settings, allow me to jump directly into the uh, basics for game theory and uh, mechanism design, unless we have some questions about this first part. Okay. I move on. Okay, so um, in a standard mechanism design setting, we have N agents, each of which has an actual type VI. Uh, you, we can think of the, the agents and what they play as, a, the, as this matrix here, where I have encoded the, the first and the second agent. Um, each agent choose their declared types, BI, which can be different from the VIs. Uh, each agent has a set of alternatives denoted here by script A and the size, the number of rows here in the table is the number of alternatives that uh, agent uh, one has and the size of the column, the number of columns is the, is, the number of, is the number of alternatives that the agent two has. And we denote the set of alternatives for all agents apart from agent I as script A uh, minus I. Okay. Now, each uh, box in this table denotes I's utility, here it's uh, one's utility, when the other agents play X minus I, which here is really, util the, which really here is the strategy of uh, agent two. So on the one hand, we have U1, X, Y, and U2, X, Y for uh, agent number two. Now, what is a mechanism? A mechanism uh, script M, takes as input the declared types of the agent and their set of alternatives and uh, spits out the outcome for each agent. Now, I'd like to stress here that it's important that we never get to observe uh, as an assumption the actual type VI. Uh, by default, we will assume that we get declared types which, will be, uh, which can be different than VIs. And let's talk about a specific mechanism that uh, Nika will be telling us uh, a lot more about uh, today, um, to auctions. So in an auction, in a general auction framework, we have N bidders uh, and a single item being auctioned. Assume that it's this drum here. Um, each of the bidders has an actual type which corresponds to their valuation for getting the item. And we will be denoting the valuation vector as boldface B. And, it, and each of these bidders has uh, bids, has, has a bid, declares a bid, which is essentially their declared type. And we denote the bid vector boldface B as B1 through Bn. And the, and the auction is the mechanism that gets us input the bids, the declared types of the agents, and uh, decides the allocation and the payment rule. And what is the allocation rule? The allocation rule is who wins the item, and the payment rule is what they pay. And after this is decided, the bidder's quasi-linear utility is measured as follows. UI, when the bidder I is bidding BI, and all the other bidders are bidding B minus I, which is value minus payment uh, if the bidder wins 
the particular item that's currently being auctioned. And I'd like to point out here that um, despite the fact that the uh, auction gets only as input the bids, the declared types of, uh, of the bidders, um, the bidder's quasi-linear utility is affected by both the true and the declared types. True type because it's affected here in the value and declared type because this decides whether you win the item or not. Okay. Now, um, it's, there are a couple of properties that are very important for mechanisms and we're going to be uh, talking about these uh, a bit now. Uh, the first property that I'd like to stress is individual rationality. Uh, we say that a mechanism is individually rational if by reporting truthfully uh, you get no negative utility no matter what uh, other agents do. And uh, why no negative? Well, uh, zero, we assume that it's the utility uh, that you get for not participating. So you do not lose anything by participating. And here's an example, first price auctions, where the allocation rule is that the highest bidder wins and the payment rule is that she pays her bid. Now, in a first price auction, if you have a valuation two for the drum and assume that you are the highest, you're the highest bidder, uh, then by bidding BI equals two, again, we assume that you're the highest bidder, you get utility just uh, zero. Why is that? Because uh, remember that the utility is value minus payment if you win the item. So if you do win the item and you bid, uh, you bid two and you, uh, your valuation was two, so that's zero. Uh, the next property that I'd like to stress is incentive compatibility. Uh, a mechanism is called incentive compatible if by reporting the true value uh, gives you always the highest utility no matter what others do. Like for example here, bidding your true VI is actually greater than or equal than bidding anything else. Let's see an example of a mechanism that's not incentive compatible. The mechanism that we talked about in the previous example, the first price auction. And assume that uh, we are um, in this regime where your true value is above the highest bid from all other bidders. So you know that if you bid your true value, um, you actually win the item. But what happens if you bid slightly below your true value? Well, you still win and you get to pay a lower price because it's a first price auction. So you pay uh, whatever you declared your bid to be if you win which means that the first price auction is not incentive compatible because you have an incentive to report something smaller than your actual value. Now, let's think about another example, another example auction, the second price auction, which um, the allocation rule is that the highest bidder wins and the payment rule is that they pay the second highest bid. So what can happen in this case? Well, assume that your true value is this blue line here. And uh, let's see what can happen if you try to misreport below your true value. Uh, if you misreport below your true value and the bid and you're still above the second highest bid, then you still win the item, but you pay the same, but you pay exactly the same amount as you would have paid. So your, your utility remains the same. Now, if you bid way below your value in a way that actually goes below the second highest bid, you end up losing the item, which means that uh, bidding below your value can actually make your utility be worse than what it was before. So you definitely don't want to below, do you definitely don't want to bid below your value. So let's now see what happens if you bid above your value. Now, if you bid above your value and you were winning the item because the highest bid is, uh, the second highest bid is way below, then you still win the item but you pay the exactly, exactly, amount, exactly the same amount of uh, money as you were paying before. So your utility remains unchanged. If however, uh, you, uh, if however, we are in a scenario where the highest bid from all other bidders is higher than your true value and you've bid so much above that you now become the winner of the item while you wouldn't be the winner if you reported truthfully, you end up losing utility because you get negative utility. You end up paying more than what you actually value the item. So bidding above can make you worse off. Okay, now let's talk about another notion in um, uh, game theory, 
which is the Nash equilibrium. The Nash equilibrium is a notion that studies the behavior of the agents, also called players, uh, because we're talking about uh, games mostly uh, when we're talking about Nash equilibrium. And how do we define the Nash equilibrium? Well, a mixed strategy X star, uh, where this is the vector for all the mixed strategies of uh, all of the agents, where Xi star is in the simplex of the alternatives for agent I, is a Nash equilibrium if by playing Xi star, when all other players play X minus I star, so according to the strategy, you are better off than playing X tilde I when all of the others are playing X minus I star. And let's see an example uh, of that. Imagine that uh, we have two politicians and um, politician number one and number two, they are trying to polish their message, uh, the, their final messages before the election and they want to understand where, where exactly they should focus and how much of their time they should focus on. And by the way, I'd like to point out here that this is a zero sum game uh, zero sum game example that I've taken from uh, the book of Desgupta, Papa Dimitri, and Vazirani. And um, why is it a zero sum game? Well, zero sum games are games where the gain of an agent, of a player, is exactly balanced by the losses of the other players. For example, here for the economy, we see that the gain for player one for playing economy is three and the loss. Uh, for agent two is the payoff of agent two for playing morality when agent one plays economy is minus three. Now, where can these numbers come from? They are not completely crazy. Such a table might encode the following example. Um, one could say that um, for politician one, if they play the economy card uh, when the when the other when the other um, when the other politician is playing the morality card is uh, strictly better for them than if they play the society card when the other politician is paying the tax cuts uh, card. So that's uh, an interesting way of interpreting this table. And what would a mixed strategy look like in this example? Well, a mixed strategy would essentially um, split probabilities into how to, how to play, how much, how much weight to devote to economy and society. It's three uh, sevenths and four sevenths for the orange agent and two sevenths and five sevenths for the purple agent. And uh, just a quick remark here is that uh, in zero sum games, any of the players can move first and the other best response, which means that if the, if the, if the first politician decided um, an arbitrary uh, deployment of time and essentially probabilities in economy and society, the two topics that we're focusing on, then the other agent, by observing this deployment, let's say that it was exactly what we have here, three sevenths and four sevenths, they would best respond to this uh, choice that player one made. And this really doesn't matter as a sequence who, who moves first. And why do I bring this up here? Well, this is very important because um, this unique property of quote unquote, it doesn't matter who moves first, um, is actually not true in a very important class of games, uh, which are called uh, Stackelberg games. Uh, and here is why. So imagine that you are an animals protection agency and you're trying to protect uh, gorillas and elephants in Africa. Now you have the capacity to, at a time, only deploy your uh, resources to one of the two species. So you can either, either protect the gorillas or protect the elephants. And you're trying to decide um, how to allocate your resources in a way that gives you the most gain. And what does gain mean really in this, uh, in this world? Well, um, it's really a game that you play, that you, the defender, plays with uh, attackers. And um, the and so th this this table encodes uh, the payoffs of the game. Um, this means that um, uh, what happens if I deploy my resources left so to protect the gorillas. This means what uh, happens if I deploy my resources right to protect the elephants. And 
um, why would I see these types of, uh, these types of uh, different payoffs? Well, uh, it's because gorillas are really super important to me. I really need to uh, defend them. Uh, why? And so I cannot afford, I lose a lot if somebody attacks their gorillas and I'm not present there because gorillas are uh, almost extinct. Uh, while they're not, so, uh, they're not so valuable for the attacker because they do not have that many parts that the attacker can, that the attacker can um, sell afterwards. While on the contrary, uh, elephants, um, I care for them a lot, but compared to gorillas, only two out of four. And um, the attacker, on the other hand, cares a lot about elephants because they have the ivory tusks that they can actually sell afterwards. So that's how such a table might actually be created. And here's how a Stackelberg game is played. Um, so let's assume that uh, you, as the defender, you deploy the following strategy. With one third, let's forget about the epsilons for now. With one third, you play the left. So with one third, you commit to protecting the gorillas. And with probability two thirds, you commit to protecting the, the elephants on the right hand side. Okay? And observe that if it is the case that you were protecting the gorillas and the attacker tries to attack the gorillas, because of the fact that you are protecting them, both you, you get no, like, no problem, so utility of zero, and the attacker does not get any utility because they cannot uh, gain anything. We are protecting the gorillas. And similarly is the case for when we are protecting, the defender is protecting, the elephants and the attacker decides to attack the elephants. Okay, so thinking about the one third, two thirds example here, uh, let's see what, let's try to compute what the, what the attacker's optimal policy is. And uh, the attacker will best respond. So they will choose the, so they will choose to attack the target that gives them the highest utility. Okay. So uh, we have one third here and two thirds here. So if the attacker wanted to attack the gorillas, then with probability one third, they get zero payoff because we are protecting it. And with probability two thirds, they get a payoff of two. And that's how the two multiplied by two thirds is constructed. Okay, now let's compute the, 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 the same things for the, the elephants. Now, if I'm protecting with probability one third the gorillas and the attacker chooses to attack the elephants, then uh, they win a payoff of four. So they win a payoff of four with probability one third. And they uh, win a payoff of zero if with probability two thirds, that is the probability that I'm protecting the, the elephants. So that's how these payoff matrices are created. And if we say that uh, we are, that the, the attacker decides to attack the elephants, so then what do we have? If the attacker decides to attack the elephants, then uh, I end up paying the minus two of my payoff matrix uh, multiplied by the probability that we are in this, that I'm protecting the left. So I'm getting one third multiplied by minus two and two thirds multiplied by zero. So minus two multiplied by one third. Okay, so a mixed strategy X star in the, uh, in the simplex uh, is a Stackelberg equilibrium. If the utility of the leader, this is the utility of the leader for playing X star, if you make the attacker, if you allow the attacker or the follower to best respond to this strategy is better than uh, the utility that the leader would get for any other strategy uh, ex tilde if they had given the uh, opportunity to the follower to best respond. And by the way, we, uh, we, use the word, we use the words leader and follower for defender and attacker respectively. And what really is X star in this example? Well, X star is the probabilities that uh, they have, that the defender has deployed. And what is RF of X star? 
this is really the uh, choice of which uh, which of the two animals to uh, attack from the perspective of the from the perspective of the attacker. Okay, and one last point that I'd like to make here is that randomization was crucial. So not having your strategies be I will deploy a hundred percent all of my uh, resources to the gorillas or all of my resources to the elephants was crucial so as not to have the attacker deterministically always attacking the other species. Okay. But let's see an example where actually pure strategies in Steinkelberg games are important and they are the only, only meaningful uh, modeling of such settings. And I'm going to be talking again about uh, classification in schools admissions where randomization is not desired. And here's why, uh, let's see an example. Now imagine as before that these were the feature vectors axis that we had. So the features correspond to features of the students that are trying to be admitted, um, that, 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 are, that are sending applications and are trying to be admitted to uh, the school. Now the leader, which is, the, uh, which is each school essentially, commits to one classifier and this is this uh, linear classifier in blue. And here is why we cannot have really randomized strategies here. A school cannot commit to a randomized classifier for students because it would have been as if they say to students that even if you, are, uh, even if you have all the qualities that can help you uh, pass the classifier and get admitted to our school, there is still a possibility that this will not happen because our classifier is randomized. And uh, here's what a pure strategy looks from the perspective of the follower, the agents, which are the students in this example. Um, if the real data point of a student is here, denoted in black, and they wouldn't pass the classifier, then by uh, slightly misreporting, uh, so committing to a misreport pure strategy, which is the different reported data point, they managed to pass the classifier and get admitted to school. And remember that these types of misreports might be taking the SAT uh, multiple times or attending tutoring classes, tutoring classes and uh, so on, okay? And with that, uh, we have completed the first two parts of part one, and uh, we are ready to hand over to Nika, who sh she will discuss about the basics of machine learning theory. Thanks, Ahara. If there are any questions, Hara will now monitor the chat and yeah. the Q&A. So please feel free to ask questions while I'm changing the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Are the slides presented properly? Okay. Okay, so for the next, um, let's see, the next six, seven minutes and the beginning of the next session, I'm going to cover some of the basics of the machine learning theory, uh, the like concepts from machine learning theory that we would be using. If you've taken an introductory graduate course in machine learning, this is going to be a review of some of the concepts that you have already been uh, introduced to. And a very typical example of when data and machine learning helps is when we want to learn from some of our past experiences. Think about, you know, you've, in your life you've had a lot of apples uh, and you want to be able to learn to classify whether an, a new apple that you're purchasing is going to be tasty or not because you only want to buy the tasty ones. So what may you think about this? You might think about the apples that you've experienced in life in a feature table and the labels of them, whether or not they were tasty, and you want to use that to learn a rule that will help you uh, classify apples as, as tasty or not. So you can think about having three objects, apples that you have tasted in the past, wanting to learn a rule that looks like a function that says I can apply it to the features of a new apple and say whether or not it's going to be tasty. For example, you might have learned that any apple that's crunchy and red is going to be tasty. So that could be a rule for you. And your goal is that on a new apple uh, the, at the bottom that you've not seen yet, uh, you can have a higher accuracy classification. So let's formalize these three things a little bit further. 
the apples that we are talking about, each of them can be shown as a feature vector. And these features are the things that you can use in your rule later on to decide what is tasty and what's not. And then the label is what you're interested in, which is to say whether an apple is tasty, yes or no. You work with training sets. Training sets are sets of apples and their level of tastiness that you've seen in the past. And the assumption in typical offline learning framework is that this data set came IID from a distribution. Okay, for the second part is you wanna learn a rule. This rule is a function. It's a function that takes the features of a new instance and will tell you what the label is. Typically, it comes from a prefix set of functions. For example, you might only wanna have a prediction or classification rules that take two features and look at their conjunction or disjunction. And lastly, uh, you wanna know whether or not your prediction rule is accurate and how you decide that is that given a new randomly generated apple and its level of tastiness, how likely is it that you're going to mispredict that tastiness level? And that is defined by this error function, which is the probability of making a mistake. In typical offline learning, the informal goal of classification is that given a sample set S from this distribution D, learn a rule H that will have a low error on the distribution D. Okay, why is this possible? Let's think about the following simple algorithm that you will take that classifier function H in your preset of classifiers that performed best on the sample set. This is actually called empirical risk minimization. And it's defined as H of S as the one that is minimizing the error. Um, why would this algorithm work? Well, for any fixed function H, Hofting bound says that error of the empirical error, error from the sample set and error on the distribution for that hypothesis are close. For those of you who don't know how thing bound, in a sense, it's saying that average of m independent variables that are zero, one, and have a prob the probability of it being one, being this kind of, this uh, error, is going to be close to this expectation. And it's written that any deviation from the expectation is going to drop exponentially fast. So this is a version of half thing bound. Now, this is for a single hypothesis or a single uh, classification rule. You can apply it by using a union bound on all possible hypotheses and all possible functions that you care about. And that tells you that every function can be accurately estimated on the set, this set of samples that you have. Why is this useful? Once you have this kind of uniform high quality of estimation, you can show that the error of this best classifier um, best possible cost of error in the distribution is going to be close to the error of empirical risk minimizing. Why? You can think about it as comparing the error of two things, the S error possible and the error of what your algorithm returned. Of course, each of them, when you compare the error on the distribution and the sample set, is going to be close to each other. So there is only an epsilon over two deviation from them. So if you manage to miss a report and instead of finding H star, find another, you know, the empirical risk minimizer, the error of empirical risk minimizer itself cannot be much larger than the best possible error. So putting this together, this basically says that if I have large enough number of samples that overcomes this coming from this kind of half thing analysis, um, then with high probability, the error that my algorithm returns is going to be only a little bit more than the error that would have been the best possible error. So this is why learning is possible, uh, especially when the function class we have is small. This, we see that we have a logarithmic dependence on the size h. In general, we showed learning through something that's called uniform convergence. Uniform convergence goes beyond classification. Uniform convergence says that for a given set of functions f, this could be real valued, it could be error function or anything. Um, I can estimate every single function within this class from a sample set. And to do that, the error that I'm going to incur is going to be what is shown here in this square root of ln f plus ln of one over delta over m. This means that if you have enough samples shown in m, then this error is going to be uniformly small for all possible functions that you have in your function class. This is what is called uniform convergence. 
And this function f, it could be the error function, like classification example we saw in the previous slide, but it could be anything. And what is important is that uniform convergence implies learnability. As in, if I have enough samples to get uniform convergence, then in choosing that function that performed best on the sample set is actually going to have meaningful uh, performance guarantees on the distribution as well. I'm talking about finite hypothesis classes, but I just want to highlight without going into details that for infinite hypothesis classes, there are concepts such as VC dimension and pseudo dimension that I'm not going to go in that will also give you these types of guarantees. Just um, to have in mind what kinds of real functions we are going to be talking about in this tutorial, um, you can think about two examples that I find helpful. One real function, real values function is that, let's say I wanna estimate the amount of traffic or how much time it gets for me to go from home to work, you know, when I used to actually go from home to work. Um, and that is something that I can estimate by driving many days from home, home to work and then estimating that. Another one that is very relevant to this workshop, this tutorial is thinking about uh, deciding to learn best possible prices for items. And to do that, you kind of want to do that from observations that you've had from uh, previously selling these items and how much you managed to make money off of. So these are some examples where we think about real valued functions. And the reason we do this is that in fact, mechanism design itself can be thought about as an offline learning uh, problem. And I'm going to go into more details about this in our follow-up session, which is in about 13 minutes, and talk more about mechanism design as a learning problem and also other models of learning that we are going to be covering in this tutorial. Um, so that's for this session.